Uh, my name is Michael Koo from the University of Southern California, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Ostley, Ostley sorry, uh, from Medtronics. Uh, let me give you a little bit about his background. Uh, Dr. Ostley um, uh, graduated summa cum laude from Harvard University as an undergraduate. Uh, for those of you from outside the US, uh, summa cum laude means you're in the top tier of the <laughs> graduating class. Um, and then he went on to do his medical school at Yale University, so he went over to the dark side. <laughs> With the, with the, I'm sorry, <laughs> just kidding. Um, um, and, um, and then he completed his internship and residency at Mass General Hospital and also served a fellowship uh, in interventional uh, cardiology at Stanford. Um, he uh, has served as associate professor of medicine at Harvard um, and uh, director of invasive cardiology at Mass General Hospital. Um, he's uh, been an innovator and teacher of, um, of cardiac uh, catheterization, and he's developed pro cardiology programs at Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles, where I'm from, as well as Georgetown University and Stanford University. Then he joined uh, Medtronic in 2002, and he's currently the Senior Vice President for Medicine and Technology. He provides uh, leadership for where Medtronic will go in terms of their their strategic planning and uh, you know development of products and, and research and development. And Medtronic, so he's a very powerful guy within Medtronic as to directions of where he wants to go. Um, so uh, he will talk to us about converging low power microelectronics, data, and communication technologies into implantable medical devices. So, Dr. Osley. Everything in the body everything that you do can be reduced to an electrical chemical reaction without exception, think about it. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone in this room that electrical engineers can and have had a major impact in the modulation of both wellness and disease. So it's my particular pleasure to talk to this audience uh, because so much of what our company is is founded on electrical engineering and a lot of what we're trying to do is, is founded on electrical engineering. So it's the interface of electrical engineers with medicine is really what our company has been about. So I'm not an engineer, so bear with me. I'm not going to be doing any fast Fourier transforms or anything here today for you. Um, what I'd like to do is give you a very short glimpse of how our company got started because it's an interesting story about an electrical engineer. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the interesting stuff that Medtronic is doing to deeply miniaturize electronics for implanted devices and share with you some other things that are going on in the startup industry around microelectronics. And I want to end with where I think medicine is going. I suspect most of you today heard Dr. Hood give his vision of medicine and his four Ps I think is correct. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the timing for that, I'm not sure, maybe 20 years. Uh, what I'm going to show you is I think some opportunities to transform medicine with uh, wearable and implanted sensors that will allow us to remotely manage patients that I think is immediate. It's going to happen soon. Much of it's already happening, and I think many people in this room can play a very important role. So I'm going to end with, with sort of my vision of medicine. We're the world's largest medical device company, and my job at Medtronic is to try to help the company understand where technology is going, what we should be doing, and what we should let other people do, and how we bring it into the company. And so I have a interesting opportunity to see globally where medicine's going, and I'll try to share with you where I see the interface for many of the people in this room. I don't know how many of you know about Medtronic, but it's an interesting Minnesota company. It was started uh, 65 years ago in a garage in St. Paul, Minnesota by a guy who's still alive named Earl Bakken. Earl's here in the upper part of this slide. He had a, had a little pot belly stove. He worked in this garage repairing medical electronic equipment. This is hence the name Medtronic. At the time, in 1949, there wasn't a lot of medical electronic equipment. For the most part, you're talking about oscilloscopes, centrifuges, things like that. And Earl would go around to hospitals in the Twin Cities and repair their 
electric equipment that needed some form of repair. One of the places he called upon was the University of Minnesota. And again, I know we have some people in the room who think of themselves as biomedical engineers. The concept didn't really exist, but I would argue that some of the best biomedical engineering that ever occurred occurred at the University of Minnesota in the early 50s, and I'll come back to that. So Earl's working in the Twin Cities in the early 50s repairing equipment. When this man at the bottom of the slide, Walt Lillehei, has to decide to embark on one of the most heroic things that a physician ever did. He really wanted to open the hearts of children with congenital heart defects and repair them. The idea of open heart surgery was not known at the time. No one thought it was possible to open the heart and operate on it because, of course, air would get into the heart and also you would exsanguinate. So Lillehei was convinced that he could get around that if he could somehow circulate blood around the heart and do what's known as extracorporeal circulation. And so this is a picture of Dr. Lohai attempting to do open heart surgery. The first open heart surgery ever done in the world was done at the University of Minnesota in the early 50s. And so Lohai, so most of you probably know that one of the most common congenital heart defects is a hole in the heart. These are blue babies. One in 100 kids are born with a ventricular septal defect. Most of them close on their own, but many of them require surgical closure. These are now closed with plugs through catheters without doing surgery. But at the time, in the early 50s, these children died. And Dr. Lilhai knew that he could probably save the lives of these children if he could simply go in there and suture up this little hole the size of a quarter in their heart. But he had to arrest the heart and somehow circulate blood around. And so his solution, was to do the following. So you can see here, this is the child who has a, had a sternotomy open, the chest is open, the heart is open, the heart is actually arrested. And so the question is, how does Dr. Lillehei keep this child alive? And the way he did it is to bring the father into the operating room. This is the father in the corner of the slide. And what Dr. Lillehei was experimenting with was a technique that he invented called cross circulation whereby I think I can, I suspect most of you know that we now have cardiopulmonary bypass where you can circulate blood while arresting the heart at the time, no such thing existed. And so Lillehei basically decided to replicate or recapitulate fetal circulation. And you would have thought he might have brought the mother in, but in this first case he actually brought the father in and he cannulated the child's artery, aorta and the vena cava and the father's and he cross-circulated blood from the father to the son. The chairman of the Department of Medicine called the police and tried to have Dr. Lilhai arrested. It's true. He said, this fool has invented the first operation that has a potential 200% mortality. And people were shocked. It was a really dangerous thing to do. He actually got away with it, but he had some complications. He did many cases this way, with both mother or father cross-circulating their blood to the child. Ultimately, engineers, before there was such a concept as biomedical engineering at the University of Minnesota, developed a bubble oxygenator. It was a gravity-driven way to circulate blood, and they were able to take this cross-circulation technique away and begin to actually routinely put children on extracorporeal circulation, begin to repair these effects. People came from all over the world to learn how to do pulmonary circulation, not to, that this operation is simple. You could all learn to do it very quickly. It's just suturing up a hole. One of the problems, and again, what's this have to do with Medtronic? One of the problems was that as Dr. Lillehei was suturing these septal defects in the septum between the left and right ventricle, some of you may know there's a big electrical bundle that goes down there called the bundle of Hiss. It's just, this is the electrical signal that comes from the atrium into the ventricle and arborizes out into both ventricles. And as he was suturing it, he was actually injuring the bundle of Hiss, and the children were struggling out of the operating room with complete heart block. So he basically interrupted the electrical signal from the atria to the ventricle with a suture, and these kids were routinely developing complete heart block. And those who have children know that they can get used to almost anything if you give them a few days. Most people in this room would not tolerate a heart rate of 25, but kids can if you give them a little time. And so the little time that he needed was to put a temporary pace wire into their heart, and he would take them out of the operating room and he'd hook, this is an adult, but he'd hook them up to a, a large AC-DC converter and he would pace these children for about a week until they were used to a slow heart rate, and then he'd pull the wires out of the chest and they'd go home. 
one night in the Twin Cities, there was an electrical storm and the child who was hooked up to an AC-DC converter pacing their heart, lost electricity and the power went out, child died. And Dr. Lilhai went to Earl Buck and said, you know, this is not working for me. I cannot be plugging kids into the wall. That's just too dangerous. I need a battery operated pacemaker. Can't you do something about it? Well, Earl was reading like many of you probably do, Popular Electronics, April 1956. And in this issue was a circuit diagram for a oscillator circuit for a metronome. Earl pirated this. This is, this, these are the, this is the schematic for the first Medtronic pacemaker. It came right out of Popular Electronics. And the concept's not different. You know, this is simply an oscillator. And, you, and it was an asynchronous pacemaker. Earl invented it. He tried it out in a dog. It seemed to work. He came in two days after he made this device. This was before the FDA existed. And the pacemaker was gone. And he went up to the operating room, and sure enough, Dr. Little High was pacing some child two days after they made this thing. And of course, the FDA wouldn't have stood for this, but that's, this is the way it worked then. And that's the beginning of Medtronic, this little temporary wearable pacemaker that saved kids' lives. And it became the foundation of the mission for our company, which still exists, which is to restore health and extend lives. Most of what we do in the company is predicated on that. Companies changed a lot. Over 65 years, we now have over 50,000 people. We operate in 120 countries. We spend about a billion and a half a year on R&D. So it's a very big company. It's diversified away from things like electronics. I'm gonna only talk about electronics today, but we do a lot of stuff. A lot of it's mechanical. We make heart valves, uh, valves on a stick. Uh, we have a, the world's largest business in instrumented diseases of the spine where we use screws and plates. Things that are all mechanical engineering. Uh, but what I, and we have a very large business in diabetes with insulin pumps, sensors, which have foundations in electrical engineering again, but I'm not going to speak about those today. Uh, the one fact, and some people say, why did I ever leave a academic medical career after 25 years to go to Medtronic? It's here on this slide. I thought my mission as a physician was to try to help as many people as I can, and all of you can do the same thing if you participate in medical devices. And it occurred to me that the biggest impact I could have is to help direct this one and a half billion dollar R&D budget to do something good for patients. We treated 10 million people last year with our devices every three seconds. Uh, some of you may know that we're in the process of trying to acquire Providian, uh, which will allow us to treat patients every second. Uh, it'll be a, it's, a, it's a big move for us, but it, it's being driven by our desire to try to extend the lives of people around the world. I'm going to come back in this talk to how people in this room could actually make a bigger impact. Because 10 million sounds like a lot. Our goal is to treat 25 million people by 2020. But what I'm going to show you is that there's about 4 billion people out there who have no access to health care at all that are waiting for people in this room to innovate. And I'll show you some ways that you might be able to do that. Again, it's my privilege to be here today and talk to a group of people who are largely interested in electrical engineering and electronics. And so there's a lot of cool things going on in medicine, and you heard again today from Dr. Hood the whole systems biology story, which couldn't be cooler. It's clearly what's going to happen. Uh, this is, is probably easier for you to get your heads around and probably get involved with. Um, so you, you be the judge. I'm going to pick two things today to talk about. One is I want to talk a little bit about deep miniaturization and low-power electronics for medical devices. Again, I'm not an engineer. I, I apologize up front about this. Uh, I'm a cardiologist, but I'll at least give you an idea of what people are working on in the medical device field. And then I want to come back and talk about sort of this convergence of communication and information technology into wearable and implantable sensors, which will allow us to begin to address the billions of people who are in need of health care. So the first thing I want to talk about is sort of high density, low power microelectronics. And I want to take the example of pacing. Recall that our company was founded on Earl Bakke making this temporary pacemaker, but of course, if a temporary pacemaker is any good, why wouldn't you have a permanent pacemaker? So it only took three or four years for the company to evolve from these little boxes that could temporarily pace people to saying, why don't we implant permanent pacemakers? Again, the first pacemaker that Medtronic was making was for children. And, but many of you in this room, probably some of you have a pacemaker. Uh, I, 
certain that everyone in this room knows somebody who has one. Um, there's several million people walking around with pacemakers today. Uh, it's life-saving for people. As we get older, lots of things degenerate. It's, it's the way it is, and you'll see more and more of this as the baby boomers move into their 60s and 70s. Uh, the conduction tissue of the heart tends to degenerate, and people require pacing to sustain life. So people felt the need to implant a pacemaker. In this little video, you'll see this is how a pacemaker works today. We, we make a surgical incision under the, uh, the collarbone, the clavicle. We make a pocket. We put a pulse generator in there that's battery operated, and it has two leads that go into the heart. And these leads basically sense and pace. Your heart beats 100,000 times a day. Think about that. 100,000 times a day your heart beats. It's a miracle that any of you are alive. If you understand what has to happen for that to kind of be organized, you have trillions of heart cells that are electrically coupled who have to talk to each other and not develop chaotic heart rhythms. You develop a chaotic heart rhythm in your ventricle and you have seven seconds to live. So it's a miracle you're all alive and it's a miracle that our hearts beat day in, day out 100,000 times a day. And so not everybody does, and so we have pacemakers that do this. And over the years, we've evolved pacemakers. And so the first pacemaker was about the size of my fist. It was basically a Kiwi shoe polish can filled up with electronics. It had mercury cadmium batteries, a capacitor. It had an oscillator in there. It had a little radio. You could communicate with it. And then it had leads. None of these things have leads. Those little tails are not leads. That's the antenna at the time so that we could communicate with these devices because they need to be programmed and adjusted. So over the years, it went from the size of a fist and lasted about a year to two years to over here on the right, this is the size of a little peppermint patty or a small piece of candy. Uh, I, it's a, basically about this size. And it's thin. Batteries last somewhere between seven to 10 years depending on the duty cycle. So that's the state of pacemaking in 2014. If you look closely on the right side of this slide, you'll see our next generation pacemaker. This is the whole thing. Uh, it's the size of an antibiotic capsule. And what's interesting about this is that this device has no lead. So on the right side of this slide, this is a conventional pacing system. It's, it's a pulse generator. It's got feed throughs to leads that are taken down through the venous system into the heart. Recall the heart's beating 100,000 times a day. That's an issue. Any of you who's a mechanical engineer probably can start to see what the problem is here, is that God didn't want you to have leads in your heart flailing around 100,000 times a day. It's a miracle they don't fall apart. And, but most of you or some of you may know that there are problems with leads and they, it's the weak part of this system if you're a system engineer, is that having these leads have to go into the heart and it, they tend to fail. They're, they're under an enormous amount of stress. So we decided to make a pacemaker where you didn't require any leads at all. And so this pacemaker on the left is a leadless pacemaker. It's, I'm gonna show you how we actually deliver this inside the heart. There are no leads that take this to the heart. And this is an example of, this is, there's nothing fancy about this. I think everyone in the room understands how you would do this. Uh, the battery on this is a seven to 10 year battery. Uh, it's the size of a Tic Tac. We make it. Uh, and again, one of the reasons that the battery can be that small and last that long is because we're right up against the pacing site. We take this right down to the endocardium. So th there's not a lot of impedance in the system and it doesn't, there's not a big current drain to do this. We make the wafer stack. We have a wafer fab in Tempe, Arizona. And so we stack together oscillators, radios, CPU memory, all gets stacked together, a tiny little feed through. And then the question is, how do you attach this to the heart? So if you watch this little video, this is kind of cool. We could teach anyone in this room to do this in a half an hour. You come up the venous system, you just make a little puncture and you come up with a guiding catheter into the right side of the heart and we just, we just push this thing out. It has nitinol wings that when the wings are unconstrained, these little hooks actually reform themselves and catch the endocardium and sustain this so that it doesn't float away. And so this is the pacemaker, this is the whole thing. This is in clinical trials around the world right now. This will be released as a product, we think, within a year. Uh, the advantage of this is, is twofold. One is that the, the, the simplicity of insertion. 
we're trying to develop a pacemaker that could be placed like in India. In the United States, there's 3,000 electrophysiologists putting in pacemakers. In India, a population of 1.3 million, there are 90 electrophysiologists for the whole country. So we can't train enough people into doing conventional pacing. This is a simpler way to do it, but it's also kind of interesting is that it doesn't require a lead. We, we think it's just going to be a friendlier system altogether. So you could say that's enough. It's pretty good, but I want to show you that we can go further. And the question is, how far can you really go with this? And, and I'm going to show you what we're doing again in our wafer fab in terms of packaging pacemakers on a, on a wafer. And it's our belief that we can make up to 60 pacemakers on a six inch platter. This is just an animation, but again, this isn't complicated. This is CMOS manufacturing. We can put on a six inch wafer, 60 pacemakers that have all the elements of an oscillator, an accelerometer, radio, Bluetooth, CPU, the memory all goes in, you just lay it down. Because these are gonna be implanted, they have to be hermetically sealed. You turn it over, now they have to be powered. And so you're looking at solid state battery technology. It's either, it can be thin film batteries, beta voltaics, you name it. This is the pacemaker that we're the next generation beyond the little tic-tac that you just saw. Uh, this is the size that this pacemaker will be. We've made this pacemaker. This is not for use. It's not under clinical trials. So I'm not selling anything here. I'm just showing you this is the potential of low power microelectronics to make a pacing element that this size. Now use your imagination. Remember I told you that everything in the body is electrically active and can be reduced to electrical chemical reaction. So whether it's the waving of your hand there in the back, the blink of your eye, the release of neurotransmitters, the contraction of your gut, contraction of your iris in your eye, just name it, just figure out any physiologic function that you want to talk about. And I assure you that we can reduce this to an electrical chemical reaction. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we can pace everything in the body, and we do. So on this image, you'll see all the areas of the body that we currently pace at Medtronic for one reason or another. Those are asterisk or under, are under investigation. The other ones are actually products. What's common to all these is that they have a pulse generator. It's been around for years, decades. And they all have to have leads because you have to take this pulse generator is big. And so you have to implant that somewhere in the body and then you have to drag leads to it. But imagine that you had something this size and where you didn't have to drag leads. You could actually put this pacing element near the action. And then you can start to see all the interesting places in the body where you can pace. It's all alive electrically alive. So use your imagination. I mean, and so these are all businesses. You could drum up any one of these as their own business. Again, and there's room for you to start companies around this because we own the field of neuromodulation. We kind of invented it over the course of 30 or 40 years, but other people have recognized this is interesting. So this morning I was listening to Dr. Hood talk about neurodegenerative diseases. Everyone needs to wake up to that. We're doomed. Again, I'm not here to depress you, but it's going to be the biggest scourge of our country in the next 30 years because people are living longer. And once you start living longer, then you're going to start to encounter all the neurodegenerative diseases that exist out there. And I hope that Dr. Hood is right, that there will be proteomic signals and we'll be able to call it out in the audience before you forget where you live. But Treating chronic degenerative neurological disease is going to be a big issue. We know that we can modulate a lot of neural circuits just by electricity. This is going to be a lot easier than genetic manipulation and all the things that are envisioned in systems biology. We do this today. Some of you may know that we actually stimulate various parts of the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia are the Cisco systems of your mind. There's a series of primitive structures at the base of your brain, and all thought and movement routes through there. And we've learned years ago that we can reroute information and we can abolish things like the tremor of Parkinson's disease, uh, the spasticity. Uh, these things can be abolished by just pacing in the basal ganglia. What may surprise some of you is that we actually have a label to pace people with obsessive compulsive disorders. So we can pace people out of obsessions. If you accept that for a minute is true and it is, it shouldn't surprise anyone in the room to hear that we can pace people out of drug addiction. We can pace people out of eating disorders. 
uh, there's no end of opportunity to modulate the central nervous system uh, because your brain is on fire with electricity. So just use your imagination. If you can start to make smaller and smaller pacing elements, this gets to be a much more interesting story. Today, the way we do this is we place a pulse generator under the skin in the chest and we drag leads up through the neck. And we drill a hole in the skull and we run these leads down trying to target structures the size of a bean at the base of your brain. It's not so easy. And so again, there's lots of opportunity for imaging, navigation. Any electrical engineer in this room could sort of figure out a career solving many of the challenges of deep brain stimulation. But ultimately, it'll be these small pacing elements that I think will change the game. And again, to pick one disease out there, it can be reduced again to some failure of electrochemical reactions and it can be modulated. Now you go back to this morning's lecture, ultimately you'll be able to do the four Ps, you'll be able to predict and prevent and have people be proactive and be part of it. But again, that's a much harder story. This is something that every electrical engineer can solve in their spare time at home. So get busy. Let me just tell you a couple other interesting things that are going on in low power microelectronics. And again, this should be no surprise to anyone in the room because this comes out of the University of Illinois. I think John Rogers has spoken here at this meeting on several occasions. Uh, if you don't know him, you should. I think he's one of the most productive electrical engineers in the world. He's at the University of Illinois. He won the Lemelson Prize, uh, I think, three years ago for the basis of his work on flexible microelectronics. Uh, again, I don't read the literature you guys do, so you've probably read about this already. I'm not going to go into this in any detail other than the fundamental thing that John Rogers and his laboratory did was to figure out how to make what they call nanomembranes out of silicon. And they can put electronics on this, they sandwich it between polyamide sandwich covers to give it some tensile strength, and they have developed a very clever way uh, with flexible interconnects to make stretchable electronics. So you might say, why do you want to do that? Well, again, you might say, why would a guy like me be interested in MC10? I'm on the board of MC10. I've invested money in the company for on the behalf of Medtronic because it turns out everything in the body is electrically active. Remember, we've been over this story. I won't say it again. We know that we can modulate it and sense many things in the body, but the problem is that the body isn't a rigid ASIC board. The heart's beating, the brain is convoluted, anything you want to sense or, or pace actually is going to require some massive flexibility of the electronics unless you want to drag one of these leads there and we don't want to do that. So you begin to look at that little micro pacing system we had, it's not flexible. It's got to be flexible. And so MC10 has figured out a way to very cleverly make flexible microelectronics and you may have seen this, they have this thing, it's called an electronic stamp. Uh, these things can be just worn on the body. They can sense things like body temperature, pH, perspiration, UV light exposure. Just again, use your imagination. All the electronics are, are really straightforward on this. It's how do you make the interconnects flexible? How do you make the actual components flexible so that you can do something with it? I'll show you one example of what we're doing with MC10. And this is basically trying to put flexible electronics onto expandable balloons. So, this is a picture of one of our expandable balloons, and what this is is a, is a balloon that is deflated and it's brought up again through the vascular system. And it goes into the heart and we actually place this balloon at the origins of the pulmonary vein and then we inflate it. And we infuse a cryo-like material here and we freeze the muscle around this. And this is a way to ablate aberrant conduction pathways that we don't want. This is called atrial ablation. It's used for a disease called atrial fibrillation. The problem is that we can't actually know if we've adequately ablated the tissue. We need to sense the electrical signals in there and sense the temperature that we're actually delivering the cryopreservative to this balloon. How would you do that? Well, you need flexible electronics. So here's an example of electrical engineering at work in a medical application, which is cryoablation for atrial fibrillation. And we couldn't figure out how to do this until we met MC10, and so they're working with us on that. Just one example. Here's another example of a Medtronic investment in microelectronics. This is not, not our company. This is a company based in Massachusetts. Some of you may know of this company. It's called Microchips. This company came out of Bob Langer's lab. I suspect everyone in the room knows Bob Langer. He has 950 patents. He's a pretty productive guy at MIT uh, who is a chemical engineer. And what they have done is basically taking a, a silicon wafer and the size of a half dollar 
and they've drilled about 100 wells into the silicon. And in these wells, they're going to put something useful. What would that be? Use your imagination. What they are working on today is a long-acting long -acting contraceptive. You could also put a hormone here. Another application this is to deliver parathormone. And so there are many proteins and drugs that have to be delivered episodically. And patient compliance is an issue. People don't necessarily take it. And contraceptives in developing countries is one. So we've also put sensors in here. We've, for years, trying to implant sensors in the body for measuring blood glucose. Problem is the sensors get fouled after about three weeks, and we can no longer sense with them. So we actually worked with microchips to implant sensors into these silicon wells, just like you implant a drug. And then what do you do? Well, these guys put a thin layer of platinum over these wells, so they seal these wells. They're hermetically sealed, so you can implant them in the body, and they won't get bodily fluids into them. Each one of these wells, there could be 100 on a chip the size of a half dollar, has a microcircuit. It can be individually addressed through a circuit. And you can program it. You can put it on a key fob and just press a button, however you want to do it. You implant this device. And the device ultimately looks a little bit like this. It has an ASIC board and memory. It has a radio in it. And you can program this to episodically blow the lid off one of these little wells. You have 100 of them. So you could have 100 doses. And every two weeks, you can program this thing to drive a little, circ a little electricity through the circuit. It's a thin layer of platinum and titanium that's just hermetically sealing us, but it's, it's, it's trivial for the body to accept that lid being blown off. It's not an explosion. And you expose the contents of this well to the body, and you can therefore release a drug or expose a sensor. It's a, it's a clever idea, again, of MEMS technology, low-power microelectronics at work in medicine. Here's a better example. Some of you may have seen this. So. Along comes Google. And you might be asking, what is Google doing in microelectronics? Well, they have a lot of money, and they have unconstrained imagination, and they have no legacy. So they basically think out of the box. And this is something being done at Google X, where they decided to make a glucose sensor uh, that could be worn as a contact lens. So Google makes their own chip. This is an 80 by 80 micron chip that has a CPU in it. It has memory. And it has a glucose oxidase sensor all embedded in this chip. It can be powered. You can see there's an RF antenna. You can power this through Google Glass if you want. You can power it through a cell phone just by putting it up. Or they've made their own thin film battery at Google X to power this with a solid state battery where you don't need these things at all. They just signed an agreement with Alcon. Some of you may know Alcon actually makes contact lenses. They haven't been in electronics in their lives. They are now. So that this will be an example, again, of very low power microelectronics as a wearable sensor. I'm going to come back to this because, again, one of the themes I want to leave you with is that wearable and implantable sensors will drive medicine in the future. Sitting here in this room, you have the ideas. Think more about it. Get busy because this is where it's all going to go. We can't afford to take care of people the way we do today. And so all the sensing will be part of either diagnostics or closed loop algorithms for taking care of people with chronic diseases. And there's just one example. Just another example, and then I'll get off the theme of microelectronics. This is another cool thing, like so many things in medicine. Once again, this is at the interface of engineering, electrical engineering, MEMS, and medicine. This is a very clever company called Replenish that came out of Caltech. Uh, this is from the laboratory of YC Tai, who's, who basically is interested in MEMS microfabrication. He has his own fab at Caltech and is one of the most creative individuals I've ever met in my life. So this is a pump that's pumped into the eye. So think about that, all of you. I bet none of you have ever thought that you would want to have a pump in your eye. And it's just one of the many miracles of medicine. People don't seem to mind it. Uh, they, they, they pull up a little piece of sclera and they implant this pump under the, don't squirm, it's, it doesn't hurt. Well, it hurts when they put it in. This has a cannula that goes right into the vitreous body. And so this is a way to put, continuously put drug into the eye. Some in the room may have this. Most of you probably know someone who does. You may have a grandmother. They go into the ophthalmologist's office every two weeks and they put a needle in their eye and they deliver drug for macular degeneration or something like that. 
this is a much friendlier way to do it. It's better, it's more compliant, and it's actually a more effective way to deliver drugs to make a pump. This pump is just microelectronics and MEMS technology. The MEMS, of course, is, are in the valve, check valves, and metering that's necessary to know what drug, how much of the drug you're giving, but this is just a little microelectronic electrolysis circuit. And it's just through electrolysis, it's pushing up a perylene bladder and pumping this drug. And again, it's just, it's just another, I think, very clever example of how you can take low power microelectronics and do something very useful in medicine. It's less invasive, it's less costly, and it's better medicine. It works. So let me change the subject to, to what I really want to sort of challenge you with, provoke you with, have you think about before I leave here today, which is how can you as electrical engineers do something good for mankind? So let me talk to you about sort of how I see and how many of us, uh, lots of people see the practices of medicine heading into this convergence with, with smartphones and things like that. Has anyone been to Chengdu in this room? So Chengdu is the gateway to Western China. This is the capital of the Sichuan province. I, I spend time there from time to time and I was there a few years ago and I had an epiphany about medicine there based on these images. Chengdu is the home of the world's largest hospital. 8,000 beds. The West China Hospital has 8,000 beds. Just to put this in perspective, there's no hospital in Chicago that has more than 1,500 beds. Most hospitals in Chicago have 800 beds. I came from the Massachusetts General Hospital, the largest hospital in Boston, 1,200 beds. Stanford Hospital, where I spent 15 years, 400 beds. 8,000 beds, but here's what's going on at Chengdu. They're building another 4,000 beds because they're running out of capacity. They're going to be a 12,500 bed hospital in Chengdu. They have to do this because there are no really good hospitals west of Sichuan province, and there's a lot of people living out there in western China. They come to Chengdu by train over the course of three or four days, and they queue up in the morning at three in the morning. You're seeing a picture of a typical outpatient clinic. You may have seen this. And it's pitiful. These people queue up, four and a half million people a year come to Chengdu just to see an outpatient visit. They queue up all day to see the doctor for one minute. One minute. And I looked at that and I said, gee, that can't be right. It just can't be right. And, and, and as I started talk, talking about the things that we do at Medtronic, if you look at all the products that Medtronic, the world's largest medical device company, sells, we sell into a marketplace of about one and a half billion people. You know, it's the United States, Western Europe, Canada, Australia, Brazil, some of these developed markets. There's another one and a half billion people who get some access to medical devices through a value segment that we don't really participate in, no US company participates in. So these are small companies in Brazil and India and China that make products that are in a different market than we, we're not in. And I, we could go into why that is, but. We don't know how to get into that market exactly. It's, again, something you can be thinking about. So that's three billion people who have some access to health care, but there's another four billion people on Earth who have zero access, none, no access at all. And this is considered access, by the way. And the question is, how are we going to ever distribute health care to four billion people, five billion people who don't have access? We can't train enough doctors. Building 12,000 beds may work in Sichuan province, but there's not many places where that's going to happen. We simply will not have the capacity to deliver health care the way that you like to get health care, the way that you all expect to get health care. It's not conceivable that we could do that for all these people. But again, and I'm telling you, I really believe this, you people can make a difference in this. There's no question about it. You can make a difference because through technology, I think it's quite conceivable that we can begin to distribute healthcare. And so what I want to talk about is how would you do that? And it gets down to sort of what is really the next healthcare provider? And I, I think it's here. It's not Apple necessarily. I mean, it's just, it's just an image. But you saw earlier today, those of you who went to the opening ceremony, this, this concept of, of the X Prize. I'm going to return to it. I mean, this kind of, there's a really interesting opportunity for people in this room to begin to think 
creatively about how you could use technology, in this case it's largely double E and software, how you could use this to actually distribute healthcare without having bricks and mortar. Now, don't get me wrong, I can't conceive of how you'll ever take an appendix out with a smartphone. It's just not going to happen. Now, you may be able to get so far ahead of it with a smartphone that you won't have appendicitis. That's back to Dr. Hood and the four P's of medicine. We may have predictive proteomics that show when people are at risk to have appendicitis and do something clever so they never have to have their appendix removed. But uh, you'll have to report to me on that. That's going to take a long time. But there's a, there's a lot of opportunity to distribute healthcare, both therapeutically and diagnostically, that I'm going to talk to you about briefly. And that has to be done somehow with communication, cell phone technology. And the good news is that there are more cell phones than people. There's more cell phones than shoes. About five years ago, I was sitting in a room at Cisco Systems with their head of strategy. And Cisco was trying to figure out what is, what is their place in the healthcare business. And I was there helping them think it through. And in the room with me were some guys from Monster.com. Now, I'd never heard of Monster.com. Maybe you haven't either. But this is, I think, a social website for finding a job. They're friends with the Cisco guy, I guess. I, I have no idea why they're in there. But they're sitting there. And they're basically saying, you know, they're saying to me, look, Steve, you know, hospitals are irrelevant. There won't be any hospitals in the future. And of course, I'm thinking, how are you going to take an appendix out? But I, they, and they said, you know, Steve, get, get with it. There's more cell phones than people. It'll all be done by cell phones. And I'm thinking, that can't be right. So I immediately Googled it sitting there. Sure enough, they were right. More cell phones than people. And over the last decade, I've been sort of mulling how would you go about taking care of people using electrical engineering and electronics. And on this single slide is my synthesis of all the elements that are necessary to remotely manage patients and their devices. And if you look at it, you'll, maybe some of you may see, I hope a few of you do see an opportunity, something you're interested in, something you want to work on. This is important. Not only is it fabulous commerce, but this is the future of medicine. It's hanging somewhere in, in this story. I've highlighted at the top and the bottom the two things that Medtronic thinks that they do pretty well, but I would bet that there's people in this room who could do better than us at implanted and wearable sensors. We are okay at distance telemetry. One of the biggest challenges we have is communication with devices once they're implanted, so think about that. Uh, it's really hard to put, make these things smaller and smaller, encase them hermetically in titanium and still have them communicate without draining batteries. So I may come back to that for a second. But down the list here are things that some of which we do, some of which we don't, some of which we do. We're not any good, really, at supercomputing. We don't do web architecture. Now, I'm told that that falls beneath the rubric of double E. So you guys will have to tell me if that's true or not. But there's a lot of opportunity here in this story, which I happen to believe is the future of Medtronic, it's the future of medicine, which is in our ability to distribute healthcare through remote patient management. Let me just give you one example of what we're working on. And the radio here is the problem, so anyone here who has a great idea, report to me later, is the radio here is really hard. And I'll come back to it. This is a wireless pressure sensor that, we're, that we plan to implant. This is an investigational device. It's not for sale. So again, I'm not selling this. I'm just telling you this is what we work on. We've spent a lot of money on this. It's going to be an active pressure sensor that's going to dwell in the pulmonary circulation of patients. And you say, why would you want to do that? Well, the single greatest consumption of healthcare dollars in the world, for sure in the United States, is hospitalized patients with so-called congestive heart failure. It's where the heart stops pumping well, pressure builds up in the heart, builds up in the pulmonary circulation, fluid extravasates into the air spaces, and you suffocate. That's called congestion, congestive heart failure. The proximate cause is a failing pump and increased pressures in the heart, which are reflecting to the pulmonary circulation. So imagine that you had a sentinel in the pulmonary circulation that measured pressure and could communicate this pressure to 
a smartphone to your mother, whoever is interested, and could get ahead of this game. And that, we think, is very doable. We've already proven to ourselves that if we monitor patients at risk for hospitalization with congestive heart failure, 35 billion a year, 35 billion, does it seem like a lot, spent by you and your friends who pay taxes to hospitalize patients with heart failure. This is mainly Medicare patients because you're paying for it. We think we could keep a third of these people out of the hospital and save the healthcare system somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 billion a year in the US alone if you simply just got this right. We can't get it right. So all of you smart people figured out the problem with this has been communication technology to, because this device is hermetically sealed. This is just a little video of what we do. Again, I can teach anyone to do this. This is, this is why this is so beautiful. It's easy to do. You just put a catheter up the venous system. It knows where to go if not thwarted by the operator. Just keep pushing it. It'll eventually go through the heart and we put a little wire out into the pulmonary circulation. Believe me, this is simple to do. And over this wire, we drag a catheter system and we launch this little pressure sensor. It has little wings on it to keep it from traveling into a small vessel and plugging it. And it just sits there and monitors pressure and then it has to once in a while report out. And this is the problem we haven't solved. And when we do solve this, we think this could be one of the biggest things we ever do. There are people, I don't know if, are there some people, are our friends from Endotronics here? Harry, where are you? No. So there are some people from Peoria, actually, that are working on a passive pressure sensor that has to be interrogated with RF. It's not a bad idea. There's many ways to do this. Use your imagination. I challenge everyone in the room. This isn't the only way to do this. I am on the board of a couple companies in Israel who are trying to measure pulmonary pressures non-invasively. There's ways to do that as well. And so, there, but if you get that right, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a multi-billion dollar company. So, this is bigger than us. I think I've alluded to this. At the bottom of this slide are all the companies that I routinely visit. Not because I'm so special, but because I represent a company treating 10 million people a year, so we have currency to talk to these companies. Every one of these companies at the bottom of the list think that they have some shining star in the galaxy of remote patient management. If you talk to anyone, they think they're the people who would bring the value. I was just in Tokyo talking to people at Docomo, broadband carrier. They lose money on text messaging. It's not working for them, and they, but they've got this massive investment in broadband towers, and so they want to use their broadband towers to carry valuable information. What would be valuable? Well, they think it's healthcare. Apple. If you talk to them, you'll see that their health kit, the next iPhone 6, is all going to be about healthcare applications. Apple, Google, Microsoft all believe that they can be at the foundation of healthcare going forward. This is where they see the future. Why do all these people believe this? Well, first of all, I think you all know this if you don't brace yourself. We spend 18% of the GDP on healthcare. It's three and a half trillion dollars a year in the United States alone. 18%. Globally, it's in the range of 10% of any country. Just pick it. This is the most important issue in every country. You go to Italy, the United Kingdom. They're not cutting back on healthcare because people believe it's their right. It is their right to be cared for. It's really expensive the way we do it. And so anything you could do in technical improvement to take the cost out of medicine is good. And it's a business. And most importantly, people will benefit. So every one of these companies thinks this is their deal. Even Cisco. They want to be routing all the healthcare information of the world. They think that's their destiny. They're not wrong. But for those of you in the room, the money is where I have circled these things in green. I happen to believe that these people are all distributing content. Who is the content provider? It's going to have to be sensed data, either wearable or implantable sensors. This whole story is driven by knowing what's happening and doing something about it. So you need a sensor and an actuator. Those are implanted. That's your business. It's our business. In the back end, again, I'm told that electrical engineers now get software as part of their story. Well, the, the data analytics are important. Again, you heard today from Leroy Hood about so-called big data. I don't know what, what you want to call this, but it's very big data. I mean, there's just massive streams of data. We plan to put those pulmonary sensors in 3 million Americans. 
streaming data all day long. We have continuous glucose sensors on 500,000 young juvenile diabetics who stream glucose data every five minutes. This is overwhelming. You can't have people in the interface of this. It has to, you have to have back-end software who sorts out who's sick and who isn't and what are you going to do about it. Ultimately, it has to be all closed loop. Here's an example of the opportunity. I've listed on this slide just some of the chronic diseases that I believe, many believe, can be treated remotely through closed loop algorithms in the cloud, sense, actuate. Not only can it be done, but it'll be better medicine. Who has hypertension in this room? Don't raise your hand, but think about it. How ludicrous is it? How ludicrous is it that you have high blood pressure and you go to the doctor once a month, she checks your blood pressure, it's high because you don't like her, and she makes a decision based on that. It's ludicrous. Your blood pressure changes with every heartbeat. How often does your heart beat? 100,000 times a day. It, you need continuous analysis of these data. There are too many data, and so again, just this goes on and on and on. I told you what the opportunity is in heart failure. The same opportunity exists in diabetes. We have a direct plan to do this. We're going to have a closed loop insulin delivery system. We're already halfway there. Ultimately, it'll be in the cloud. And kids will be monitored. They'll be instructed. They'll get messages from the cloud saying, what the hell are you doing? And you can start to see how this will be better for the kids. And it'll be better medicine. It'll be cheaper. Everybody wins at this. But believe me, this isn't finished. And there's so many opportunities for the people in this room to get busy. Um, it's where all the money is, you know. You might say, gee, it's in consumer electronics. Well, it is, other than that, it's commodities. This isn't commodities, this is people's lives. And so there's a, just a really interesting opportunity here. You heard about this today. Um, I'm gonna stop with this. This is the diagnostic piece of it. We're not a diagnostic company, but this is clearly going to happen, and it was alluded to both in the opening conversation, and Lee Hood also came back to this. Remember, he showed you this microfluidic system where you put a drop of blood on and, and you can measure 50 proteins. Well, again, there's some young people here in the room. It's going to happen on your time where you will be able to take a smart phone and, and nick, prick your finger and drop a piece of blood or, or urinate on it or spit on it or blow into it or do all those things, you know, and it's going to chip back with you and it's going to not be that expensive to say, you know what, you ought to go see the doctor because you've contracted tuberculosis. Right. So the X prize is actually, that's one of the diagnoses, by the way. You can look it up, it's kind of cool, and they, you have to give 15 diagnoses better than doctors. That's why they, this is a picture right off the X prize. The, the challenge is that they have to make 15 diagnoses better than a team of physicians could do on a smartphone. And again, it's, it's going to be expensive to do this right away, but the people are going to make some money doing it. But ultimately, because the technology is exponential, this will come down, maybe not in all of our lifetimes, but in many of your lifetimes. This is a dream. I think it's definitely going to happen. The, the people will walk around and mo they won't go to the doctor. They won't get on this train in West China and go to Chengdu. How crazy was that? Because they're only seeing the doctor for a minute. How good do you think she is? Whereas, imagine that you had just a smartphone. You weren't feeling well. My daughter was just in, in Peru. I nearly had to air evacuate her. She was really sick. She turned out to have salmonella. Now, she could have probably pooped onto her phone and figured this out someday in the future, but at the time, I spent a lot of time and effort and anguish trying to understand if my daughter's life was in danger, and it could have been so much simpler, and it will be, and you people in this room have a chance to do it. So what was all this about? I'm not sure myself. I mean, I, you know, I work for a really interesting company where we spend a billion and a half trying to do smart stuff, and it's never enough money, and we never get it all right. We rely on John Rogers and Bob Langer and a lot of people, Google X, to figure some of this stuff out. But a lot of us here in the room, and again, it's my distinct privilege to be here talking to the IEEE. I've admired your organization for years. I'm just a simple cardiologist, not an engineer. But I think the things that I've tried to show you today get up against what you can do. This is not the four Ps. This stuff is immediately realizable. It's, it's just engineering. 
one of the great things about medical devices as compared to biotechnology, which you're hearing about, biotechnology re relies on discovery. Someone's got to discover a molecule or a protein or a target. It's people working at the bench, pushing it out to the bedside. Medical devices actually have a vector of innovation that's 180 degrees the other way. Get this. If you find any of the devices that we sell and ask, where the hell did that come from? It came from the bedside. Someone couldn't deal with a degenerated disc or a failing heart or a heart block, and they articulate a problem to an engineer who invents. Discovery for biotechnology, invention for medical devices, and you're sitting in the room. Just get busy. Thank you very much. So, I have to leave if you miss it. If there's anyone who had a particularly germane question, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, but I'm, I'm open to it. Um, if anyone has any answers, I'd be more open to that. So, at any rate, I, I'm very easy to reach. If you have something you want, we're going to take one question here, and then I'm, then I'm going to go. I'm going to unplug while we do this, if you don't mind. Yeah. Please. Just if you could tell me who you are. Mr. Campagnolo from CLAG in Cologne. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, I was interested by your paper, and I have a question about your feeling about the new program called Electrosuffix, where uh, pharmaceutical companies yeah. tend to okay. treat our disease using electrical signals. Yeah, so what, what, just to make it very clear, what I believe you're asking is that there, th th this just makes me laugh. There's, the pharmaceutical companies, and in particular GSK has been leading this, have come up with the concept that they like to call electroceuticals. Now, what is that? That's neuromodulation. We've been doing it for 40 years. And so what they've figured out is that, and anyone who think about it, is that you can't actually affect very many good things with pharmaceuticals. It's just my opinion. And so they've realized what we've known along is that the, one of the nice things about devices is that there are no side effects usually from devices. We do have some untoward events and we have device failure, but we generally don't have unanticipated side effects from like the pharmaceutical company does. So GSK, Novartis, a bunch of people are getting into so-called electroceuticals. It's really just the stuff we've been talking about. And so my feeling is, yeah, good idea. I, I applaud it. So GSK has a, has a venture firm. It's called, it, I think they call it Axon or Action Potential or something like that. Do you see them as future competitors? No. no. Not, not at all because they're constrained by legacy just like we are. Our competitors are these people I was showing you, Apple, Google, Microsoft. Uh, I, I view them as collaborators. But I, I think our competitors ultimately are going to be the bright people in this room who understand software and microelectronics. You know, we've had it too good for too long, and we have to collaborate with them. I, I don't, we can't solve it on our own, but am I worried about GSK? Gee, I don't think so. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, bye. Well, on behalf of EMBS, I'd like to thank again Dr. Stephen Osley for his excellent talk, and I'd like to give him a, a token of our appreciation for coming all the way here.